We happen this month to really be, we're going to be emphasizing the importance of having good relationships. Because many times we, we come to church and we come because we want to connect with God. But remember Jesus Christ said what? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and your strength. And then it says you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the biggest struggle we have in church is not that people don't love God. I think a lot of people love God. But a lot of us are struggling with loving each other. And part of the reason we struggle with loving each other is because we don't love ourselves. Because Jesus says you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if you haven't learned to love yourself, accept yourself with all your limitations, with all your challenges, with whatever you want to say, I am going to appreciate who God has made me to be. And you're, you're comfortable with yourself. If you're not yet comfortable with being who you are, it is very hard for you to love somebody else. But I pray that God will help you receive his love, receive his forgiveness, receive his freedom. Many of us struggle with guilt, with condemnation, with things that have happened in the past. And even when we come to God, we don't feel worthy. But I pray today in the name of Jesus that you will know that you have a father that loves you unconditionally. And as you come in his presence, just come to him as a father. And say, Lord, I am just in your presence as I am. And I thank you because you received me and teach me to love me. Love myself. Amen. Let's go to the book of Proverbs. Um, last Sunday, I, um, I talked a little bit about certain things that we need in our lives if we're going to have better relationships. Today, I'm going to focus more on marriage for obvious reasons. One, because today is our anniversary, praise the Lord. And, uh, but also because I see and this is not uh, just a prophetic word, but I actually feel it. We are about to have so many weddings in this church. <laughs> ah, I didn't hear an amen. I said we are about to have many weddings in this church. Yeah. Every month, you know, we are having a wedding. Praise the Lord. So I feel like God, as your pastors, God is calling us to prepare you. Now, um, some of us may say, oh, I'm not thinking about marriage right now. Just keep this someone. It's going to help you. Amen? Just don't, don't, don't say, oh, don't switch off. Because you can be in a service and you switch off. You say, ah, this message is not for me. It is for the other brother who didn't come today. No, just open, receive your, open your heart. Because these principles I'm going to talk about are not just about marriage, because life is not just about marriage. We all know that. Every day at our place of work, at our school, wherever we are, we are relating with people. Of course, marriage is the most powerful uh, relationship because even Jesus Christ himself compares himself to a married, you know, he has married his church. So he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved his church and gave himself. So, we're going to have a marriage supper in heaven. Amen? There's going to be the wedding of the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb, when Christ is having the, he's wedding his bride. That's how powerful, that's how much God has elevated this institution of of marriage, because there's going to be that wedding supper of the Lamb. Amen? And, and the bride, that, you know, the bridegroom is going to be coming to receive his bride. Amen? But I want us to go to the book of Proverbs. Today we're going to look at chapter 15. Last Sunday, I talked about certain things we need in our lives if we're going to, let me not, may not use the word survive, but if we're going to thrive, 
Amen. If you're not just going to endure each other. Because there are a lot of people who are married, but they just endure each other. They don't enjoy being with each other. They endure. Uh, but God wants you to enjoy life. He says, he came that you may have life and have it in abundance. And life, you know, life begins at home. Life begins at home. If your home experience is bad, it's going to mess up your entire life. Are we together, church? And so it's time for us, we start to have some, some of these things, talk about some of these things in church. So last week we talked about, uh, we, were in, we were in Proverbs chapter 18, we talked about some of the things that we have to look at in our own lives uh, and, and we started with what attracts people to other people, um, which some people call chemistry. Uh, we said, you know, things like personality, a smile, values, beauty, money. Uh, but we say that the most important thing is values. Bible says beauty is fleeting and charm is deceptive, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Amen. So what we should be looking at, even as we relate, of course, we're talking about um, marriage, but also even as you look for your friends, because your friends will determine who you become. Someone said, if you want to know how your life is going to be in the next five years, you have to look at the five people in your life right now. If all your friends are where you are, then you need to look for another group of friends. You need to have people that are challenging you, people that are drawing you to be better. So you have certain things that are attracting people or repelling people from you, whether you know it or not. And one of the best ways we can attract the right people in our lives is to make ourselves better. And the best way to do that is to have values in our lives. Amen. Then you also say that it's important for us to be confident. To be confident. Confidence is, is also about your character. I mean, your, your courage, sorry. Courage. When you are confident, they say that courage is fear that has said its prayers. You've heard that statement. It doesn't mean that you are not afraid. You may be afraid. You may not be comfortable, but courage and confidence is very important in life because there are a lot of people who are so have such a low self-esteem, low self-confidence that they're expecting somebody else to compliment them for them to feel better. But God wants you to know that you can do all things through Christ. Amen? Amen. You have to have that I can. I can succeed. I can make it. I can prosper. That I can, the belief in yourself is very important. It is important to believe in God but a lot of people fail, not because they don't believe in God, but because they don't believe in themselves. They don't believe they can pass that interview. They don't believe they can get that job. They don't believe they qualify. They're expecting the papers you get in school is not what is going to make you successful in life. Hello? So you're, you're having papers or lack of papers is not what makes you successful. A lot of it is about knowing now they are important. It's important to have papers. It's important to go to school. It's important to read. It's important to expand your network. But most times, have you found people that don't have the papers, but they are so confident? They don't have everything everybody thinks is important, but they have a confidence they, they, they walk with confidence, and that becomes attractive to people and opens doors for them. And so the Bible says that the righteous are as bold as 
as a lion. But the wicked flee when no man is pursuing them. We, we have to know that we have the righteousness of God. Amen? And let us be bold. Let us be confident. Amen? Hello? Let us be confident. I know one of the hardest things, and because I did this, one of the hardest things is to propose to a girl and tell them you want to marry them. It takes guts. And I always tell people, please, sisters, even if you don't want to marry that guy, please don't, please be, be gentle. Because it takes so much guts. <laughs> but some, some, some sisters just don't care. They, they don't know how much this brother has prayed, maybe even fasted, gathered strength just to be able to say that one word. It takes a lot of confidence. It takes a lot of confidence. But God has called us to be confident. I mean, you can, I'm almost getting ahead of myself. You can look at someone so beautiful and you keep looking at them. But until you have the confidence to say a word, somebody else will just walk by, say something before you know it. <laughs> they have taken your blessing. And you're like, but I had this word in my heart all the time. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Where are the bold men in the house? Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm telling you, sisters are waiting for some bold men. I, I, did I say that? Okay. Now, Proverbs 15, and then I'm going to pray for the someone and I'm going to begin preaching. The Bible says, verse 1, says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you because your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We are all in different parts of our journey of, of life, but I pray that even through this sermon, Lord, that you will help us. Help us to have better relationships. Help us to be able to succeed in those areas that many have struggled in that we will not fail because others have failed. And even where we have failed, that from today, our lives are going to be better. In Jesus' name, amen. What I want to talk about a very important aspect of relationship, uh, and it happens more and more as you get closer to somebody, and that is something called conflict. Conflict is something that you cannot avoid if you're going to be in a relationship. And a lot of us struggle because we do not know how to handle conflicts, how to handle, how to manage conflicts. You will find conflicts if you are a leader leading people. If you're, for example, a pastor leading people. Not everybody is going to be happy with every decision you make. Not everybody is going to be pleased with you. And one of the things that I had started learning the moment I started pastoring is that no matter how well I preach or no matter what I do, there will still be people who feel it's my time to move and go to another church. And it's not that they are bad. It's just that you have not ministered to their need. And so I have learned to just release people and bless them and say, oh, God bless you. May God go with you. Praise the Lord. Because I said, uh, we, apart from marriage, every other relationship, people come in our lives for a season and for a reason. And sometimes we struggle because we are still holding on so much to people whose season has come to an end. Or we are still trying to hold on to somebody and yet the reason God brought them in their lives is over. And so it takes wisdom for us to know God brought you, you have been a blessing, but also I release you and I have nothing against you. I think we have to get to that maturity in the church that when somebody leaves the church, it doesn't mean they're our enemies. We still have to bless them. We still have to call them. We still have to pray for them, amen, because they're still children of God. 
Uh, but I want to get now to this, our story about conflict. Because in church, you find conflict. In church, you find people who get offended because of what somebody else has said. How much more when you are staying with somebody and you are living with them every day, conflict is bound to happen. In fact, I always have, I always, not, 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 not a fear or a concern, but when I'm talking to people who have been together, married, and they say, oh, for us, we've never quarreled. For us, we've never had a problem. I'm like, you guys are not real. One of you must be an actor. <laughs> One of you must be a comedian. <laughs> because there are no two real people who can live together and be themselves. And just say they have, ne oh, you know, for us, no, every time it's just okay. You know, praise and worship us. <laughs> It is not real because we are saved, but we are still human beings. And human beings get offended. Human beings get angry. And by the way, anger is not a sin. It is when you, what you do with the anger that becomes. The Bible says that, be angry, but do not sin. And don't allow your anger to stay over the night. You know that scripture? I just paraphrased it. Somewhere in Ephesians chapter 4. Is it verse 29 or something? Don't allow your anger. Be angry. Even Jesus Christ was angry when he found people in the temple. He, the Bible says that he beat them up. He kicked them out of the temple. Jesus was so angry. And so there is that place where we all have anger. But anger becomes bad when it becomes, when it becomes uh, what do you call, some people have a short fuse. You, you, you've heard of such people? You know, and, and when you have a short fuse, it means that you break very quickly. And you do things you regret or say things you regret. That anger is bad. But there's something here, the Bible says, that is an antidote to anger. And they call it a soft answer. Someone say a soft answer. Yeah, let's first go to this. Uh, you've read it. You brought that Ephesians. 420, it's 426. says what? Be angry, but in your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. So you can be angry and not sin. And one of the ways is to learn how to be soft, even when you're angry. Now, those two things don't seem to be possible. Anger and soft answer, they don't seem like they work together. <laughs> you know, you're angry, but you use a soft. Someone makes you so angry, but you answer softly. It takes the grace of God. Someone says it takes the grace of God. But the Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. It doesn't matter how angry someone is. You know, there's, there's a story, I hope I'm able to tell it well, of, um, of, of this woman, I think, who needed help, you know, with, with her husband. And uh, I think he it was a counselor or something. Someone I'm sure knows this story better. And the counselor says, you know what you do? Whenever you're angry, just get water. Put the water in your mouth. Okay? And just keep that water in your mouth. You know, and it's going to work. Now I say, but how is that going to work? He says, no, no, just drink water and just keep the water in your mouth, you know. And uh, so she, this, you know, every time there is an argument or whatever, the woman just drinks water. <laughs> and he goes back and says, you know what? It worked. Because the times when you are angry, it's not the time to respond. Most of the time when you are angry, you're going to respond badly. 
So how do we get a soft answer? It means that we have some time to retreat and allow God to cool us down. And then be able to speak a soft word. And a soft word, most of the time, could be, I am sorry. I don't know how many of you that those three words are the hardest words to say. Now, I know we are in church, and all of you are going to pretend like you just came from heaven, and every time you're saying you're sorry. But I've, I've found out a lot of people struggle with saying, I am sorry. A lot of people struggle saying, I am, I am sorry. Especially when you think it is the other person who needs to say, I am sorry. But sometimes it's even good to act like a fool and say, I am sorry. Even when the other person is supposed to say, I am. Maybe that's a soft answer. The Bible doesn't tell us what kind of soft answer, but just says a soft answer turns. But if you want trouble, use a harsh word. But a harsh word stirs up anger. So someone is angry already. If you use a harsh word, you know, there was a man of God who, who died, but I used to like listening to him a lot, Miles Monroe. And, and he said something. He says, men act, women react. Yeah? Whatever you give a woman, they will nurture it, and they will, they will, they will reproduce it and bring birth. Bring it back. Good measure, shaken together. <laughs> so a man, you can think you have a word. You speak it. What the woman will bring back. <laughs> Seems some people know what I'm talking about. And you can imagine when that word comes and you're already angry, what happens? <laughs> so, when what the Bible is saying here is a harsh word, how can God help us to make sure? Because this, friends, is the basis of being born again. Being born again is not how much you pray in the spirit, pray in tongues. It's not how much you dance in church and raise your hands. All these are wonderful, but it really comes down to how do you relate. And not with people who don't know you, because you can pretend in church. But people who know you at home. I don't know how many people I have talked to. And children struggle to serve the Lord because their parents are pastors, but what they see on the pulpit and what they see at home are two different things. And they struggle. People struggle to believe we are believers because what they see at work and what they see when we're telling them about Christ are two different things. And so the best way we can demonstrate Christ most of the time is actually just through our words. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. We're already there. Chapter 4 and verse 29. Ephesians 4.29. It says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. That's a high standard. It's saying, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. You know, I, I started learning this. Now, I'll be the first one to confess I was not always like that, especially when I've just been married. When my wife gets, gets me angry, I want to make sure I give her something that will let her know I am the man. But as I said, she will wrap it, put sugar, put salt if necessary, some spices, bring it back. <laughs> but I, 
I learned that my salvation experience and the power even of my ministry is so much about what I say. There are certain things God will not use me to do until I learn to control what I say. Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 19. Jeremiah 15 and verse 19. Uh, God speaks to this man. He was a prophet. He tells him, if you return, I will restore you. And you shall be my mouth. Can you imagine God telling you, I want to make you my mouth? 15 verse 19. Verse 19. He says, I therefore says, if you return, then I will bring you back and you shall stand before me. Another version says, I will restore you as my prophet. It says, if you take out, continue, if you take out the precious from the vial, you shall be as my mouth. Now, I want us to get another version because this one does not bring it out very well. There's a version which says, if you learn to separate between the worthy words and the worthless words, then I will make you as my mouth. Another version says, I will make you my prophet. I will make you my spokesman. So God is telling Jeremiah, Jeremiah, what you say can hinder what I want to say through you because you have not yet learned to separate what is worthy and what is worthless. You know, many times we are, we are believers, but the kind of jokes we make, the kind of words we use, you know, the, sometimes we, 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 we just carelessly use curse words. Uh, and God is saying, I cannot use the same mouth to proclaim healing, to bring deliverance. And so that, that becomes even more important in a conflict. When there is a conflict, the thing that we're supposed to watch the most is what we say. Because what you say can make it easier or it can make it worse. A lot of people come to church needing prayer for their relationships. But really what they need to do is to learn when to keep quiet. That is what they need to pray. Say, Lord, give me... <laughs> Where is that scripture? It says, put a guard on my mouth. You know that scripture? It says, David is praying and says, Lord, put a guard. Teach me how to put... It's almost like you, you put a padlock on your mouth. When you really are boiling to say, I say, God, put a guard. Someone say, God, put a guard on my mouth. Hallelujah. Let's go to Proverbs 15, verse 2. It says, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. The, 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 the thing that we need, I need deliverance. And I'm not just talking about everyone else. I'm talking about myself because it is something we all struggle with. It is what we say. Bible says what makes people know that you're wise is how you speak. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge. And, and more so in a relationship, in a marriage relationship, in a family relationship, uh, but as I'm going to talk more about marriage or maybe even um, parent-child relationship. Words are so important. We know this scripture. I, I believe all of us know this scripture. Proverbs chapter, is it 28 verse 19? Is it 28, 19? It says what? The mouth has the power of death and life are in the power of the tongue. Is it 28, 19? Uh, forget where it is. I just remembered it. Death and life. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, but that can help me find it. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Our words can kill 
18.21. Proverbs 18.21. The tongue can kill death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. So what we say is not just words. What we say have power to heal. What we say has power to kill. What we say has power to destroy. What we say has power to bring life. When, you, when I understood that, I said, you know, I pray God give me the tongue of the wise. Because the tongue of the wise helps us to know how to make proper, say proper words. You know, uh, when you read the book of Proverbs, I think half of it is just about words. Words. Words fitly spoken. I like what? Apples of gold in pictures of silver. You know, like words that have been spoken well. He paints a picture. It's like, it's like you have apples of gold and you've set them in pictures of silver. I mean, the words we speak can open a door for us or they can close the door. The words we speak can cause life. As, as, as we said last Sunday, some people, you know, they say, the words you spoke to me, I wish you had just beaten me instead. Because the wounds that come from words are harder to heal than even the wounds that come from beatings. Some of us are struggling today because of what your father said to you, because of what your mother said to you, because of what somebody that you loved said to you. And, and you still struggle with that today. And, and we need deliverance from that because words have creative ability. So anytime you find yourself in a conflict, anytime we find ourselves in a conflict, we should ask God, say, God, help me, give me the right words. Help me to answer. How should I answer? How should I talk back when I'm angry, when I'm, I'm anxious? When, how do I speak? Because that is going to determine your happiness. Amen? Now, you have to expect conflict. Jesus had conflict. If Jesus had conflict even within his own disciples, and they couldn't understand each other, and he had to talk to them. I mean, we all are going to have conflict. So it's not about whether it's coming or not. I mean, let not, you know, a lot of people when they're, again, when people are, 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 are dating, when they're courting, before they get married, people pretend a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of, uh, I don't know. I mean, some people say, oh, the longer you relate with someone, it will help you know them. No, it's not true. Because as long as people are just, you're just meeting them, they will come when they're smelling good, when they're looking good, when they're talking good. They've been preparing the whole day to meet you. But, but you will really get to know who this person is when you have been together the whole day and you have spent the whole night together and now they are angry in the morning and they didn't even prepare, then that you will know the true colors. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. But that's life. Because we are not meant to just live artificial lives. We are meant to be real. But unfortunately, the settings of our, gener our times today cannot allow us to be real. We have Facebook we have all these things where it allows you. Now there's even AI. You can even change your, how you look. And, 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 and so we are not real. And, and, and we don't want to be real because we think when we are real, people will reject us. People will not want, like us. And, and, but, and, and now when people realize who you really are, that's why it is very dangerous to lie. Be yourself. Say the truth. Because when someone finds out that you lied, it becomes worse. Especially as children of God. Amen? Do children of God lie? Yeah, they don't lie. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Ephesians, again, chapter 4. Paul is speaking these very important things. He's talking to people who are now born again. He tells them, put away lying. 
put away what? That means even believers lie. Chapter verse 14 says, and verse 15, sorry, chapter 4, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him, into all things, which is the head. Then verse 25, he says, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one body. Do you know the other way we can overcome conflict is by saying the truth? Because I can say, the Bible says, uh, open rebuke is better than secret love. How many of you have heard that proverb? I mean, I love the proverbs. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Many of us avoid conflict, and so we keep fluttering. We keep saying nice things. But a time comes when you cannot keep saying nice things, when you have to say the truth. And if you have just been telling someone nice things, now when you tell them the truth, they will think you don't like them. So not everybody who is nice to you is your friend. And, not, and your friend does not have to be nice. In fact, I love my wife so much because she has not really been so nice most of the time. When I just married her, I would say, oh God, what did I do to deserve this? Like, I felt like she's panel beating me and she's straightening me. Everything I thought was good about me, even if I come back home and think I've preached a good someone, says that was not good enough. <laughs> but you know, she has made me better. Because God knew I just need, didn't need someone in my life who's just saying, yes. You know, everything is good. No, no. Someone who can see what I cannot see. Someone who can be able to tell me where I am wrong. And I don't like that. The flesh doesn't like that. I don't like being criticized. I don't know who likes being criticized. But I don't like it. But I learned now to appreciate it. And actually, one day I was praying and God told me, listen to your wife. I said, did I hear God well? You know, I'm angry. I'm like, you know, says, Go back and listen to your wife. So not everybody who is nice is your friend. And your friend doesn't have to be nice. In fact, sometimes you need to ask yourself, in my relationship, am I just having people who just are always pampering me? Because you cannot grow in a comfort zone. Someone says, say that again. The reason you are where you are is because you have been in a comfort zone for too long. Everybody around you just tells you how wonderful you are, how excellent, how majestic you are. But you are not God. You are not perfect. So you need people in your life who can push you to a higher level. You need people in your life who can, you know, can help you become better. Become better in the way you manage your finances. Become better in the way you manage your life. You, you know, you, ha you need people who can challenge you and tell you, no, 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 where you are, you need to be better. And so today, I came with that. Hallelujah. I hope you'll still come back next Sunday. But if you get better, it's okay. Praise the Lord. Because I just don't want to see you in the same place. God has raised me as a pastor, not just to tell you about things that you like to hear but the things that are going to help you become better. Praise the Lord. So you need to appreciate people who push you. People who encourage you to be better. People who encourage you to move on. You know, I really, as I said, I really thank God for my wife because she's always been that push that I need. Have I always enjoyed it? No. But after some time, I'm like, if it wasn't for this woman, I think I would have still been somewhere. Because every time she's pushed me to be better, to believe for more, to trust God, to do things more excellently. Praise the Lord. Someone clap your hands for my wife. <laughs> and I know after this someone, I'm also going to have another lecture, but it is well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, 
I, I talked about a little bit about conflict a little bit longer. I just want to finish with this. Because it's very important. It was very important for us to understand you can survive conflict. Amen? Conflict is not a bad thing. You need to embrace it. Embrace conflict. See what you can learn from conflict. Don't fear to get married because of conflict. If you try to avoid conflict in marriage, you'll still find it outside there. Every place in your life, there's nothing easy. Being single is not easy. So if God brings someone in your life and we are praying that God brings that person, don't run away from them just because they seem to be, you know, always helping you get better. Let me just use that word. They're always saying, oh, you need to dress better. You need to do this better. No, no. Appreciate that. That shows how much they love you. Someone say, amen. The last thing I have to talk about today because of time is um, understanding covenant. Okay? Now, we, we talked about commitment. We talked about um, character. Uh, but it's very important for us to understand that not every I mean, not every relationship is a covenant relationship. But there are relationships that have been designed as a covenant relationship. And when you're entering a covenant relationship, you have to know this is a relationship that is for life. Part of the reason why a lot of marriages are having problems, in my opinion today, is because we do not understand what a covenant is. In the Old Testament, and even in the old African culture, they never used to really do weddings. Even in the Bible, we, we, we don't have the kind of weddings where you know people would come to church and, and be prayed for and and. I am for weddings, and I want you to come to church, and I want to pray for you. But I want to say this, and I want you to listen to this very well. Just because a pastor has laid hands on you does not guarantee that you're going to have a successful marriage. Should I say that again? Just because you have come to church and you have had what we call holy matrimony is not the guarantee for a successful marriage. Because the pastor bestows heavenly blessings on you, spiritual blessings on you. But just like everything, these are spiritual blessings that now you must work out in the natural. Legally, we are exalted. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Legally, we, are, we have everything. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. But there is a part that we have to walk in life and live to. And unless you're willing to put in the work and do what you're supposed to do, you will not be able to experience those spiritual blessings. And so... A lot of us, why we are not experiencing the blessings is because we don't understand covenant. What is a covenant? In the olden days, even in the African culture, when people were entering into a covenant, they would cut their bodies and blood would come. And they would get maybe like a bean or a coffee bean is what they used to use. They would put it in the blood this person puts it in the other person's blood, and this one puts in there, and then you take the different beans. And once you take those ones, now you have taken each other's blood, you are linked by covenant. It's a blood relationship. And because of that, people would not sign letters. You know, like they had no signatures, whatever. If you want to do a deal, you just know I have made a covenant. I have made this. And people would know I have to respect this. Jesus Christ offered his blood and opened for us a door into a new covenant, which is the covenant of his blood, and that's why we are saved. Amen? And Jesus can never turn back on his covenant. Isaiah chapter 54 verse 10 says, though the mountains may depart, 
my covenant of peace. Is this Isaiah 54 verse 10? Isaiah 54, I think, Isaiah 54 verse 10. My covenant of peace will never, will never depart from you. It says Psalm 89 verse 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the words that come out of my mouth. So God is a God of covenant. And we must appreciate covenant. And the covenant that he has given us, besides the covenant of the, of the body of Jesus, we, we, among us men, the covenant that we have, that is in the Bible, is the covenant of marriage. So marriage is not a contract. It's not something you do for trial and error. Let me see if this will work. We're living in a time where people just say, oh, let's go live together for some years and see if it works. If it doesn't work, you know, at least we don't have a commitment. The fact that you're already living together, there is blood that is being shared, that's already a covenant whether you've gone to church or not. So it's important for us to understand marriage is not a what? A contract. It is not a trial and error. It is not saying, let me debt this one and debt the other one and debt the other one. No, 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 no. It is about knowing what is my destiny connection. The person that God is bringing in my life, this must be somebody that is connected to my destiny. This must be somebody that is going where I'm going. This must be somebody that can collaborate with me. This must be somebody that we can agree together, move together, and, 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 and fight life together. Friends, life is so short for us to keep rehearsing. To keep trying out things. We must determine this is the journey I want to go. I just need God. Say you pray and say God bring somebody in my life. That will help me on this journey. I can tell you without fear of contradiction. If I hadn't married this beautiful woman. I wouldn't be standing before you. If I hadn't married Deborah. I wouldn't be in the ministry today. I wouldn't. There are times when I was, I would feel so discouraged. There are times when I would feel, and she would be the one to just encourage me and pray for me and believe in me. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget when we had just launched Impact Church. Just a week after we launched the church, I lost my mother. She died in an accident. I received the news. She just had an accident in Uganda. And I was like, God, how, what do I do? We were in the middle of a 21-day fast. I've never felt the kind of pain that I felt. I mean, I, I, I now understand when people are grieving. I mean, I, don't, I, I sometimes just sit there and just, I don't have a word. Because I, tears were coming nonstop. I was not trying to cry. Tears just kept coming. And I just didn't know what to do. We, we just stopped this church. Because uh, we said the church on the 5th of January, I received the news on the 12th, just a week later. My wife was pregnant with twins. And she just told me, you know what, you just go. I will stay here and take care of the church. Praise the Lord. And she would come. We were in a very small place. It was a basement of a building. She would come. I still remember. She would come. She's so heavy, you know, with twins. But she would get that mop, clean up the place, arrange the chairs, because it was really us and a few other people. And then she would also come preach or introduce whoever is going to preach. I was away for, what, three weeks? I came back, and the church was still there. And we were able to move on. If I didn't have the right person, that was the end of Impact Church. Because there are times when you're so broken, you can't help yourself. You need someone who can believe in you. Someone who can say, yes, let's keep moving. Let's go. Keep Friends, life is not easy. Being a pastor is not easy. But what is easy? I mean, doing a job is not easy. Everything in life, you go through tough times. And sometimes you just need somebody who can say, I still believe in you. I still believe in you. I know you are down. I know you seem like things are not working. But I still believe we can make it. I still believe in you. I still believe. I pray that you'll be that to somebody. And let me pray in the name of Jesus that God brings somebody in your life that can believe in you. 
may the Lord bring someone who will be like Jonathan to you. That they, were not, they are not scared of you being better than them. But they are there. They know that their role in life is to help you become better. I pray that as Impact Church, we can be that to you. That when you feel down, when you feel that you cannot make it, we will encourage you. We will push you. We will say, just keep going. Don't give up. Don't give in. There is a better life ahead of you. I pray that you will not give up on life. God has something good for you. I know you've been heartbroken. I know you've been wounded. I know you've, things have not happened the way you expected them to. But I, I, in the name of Jesus, I want you to know that God has the best days ahead of you. You can still believe. You can still hope in God. You can still trust in God. God is a good God. No matter how bad and evil the world is, God has a good plan. And no matter how men have hurt you, I believe that God still has somebody who can love you. Just close your eyes. Father, we give you the praise. Come on, talk to God. Father God, I pray right now, I feel that there are people in this place that you're struggling with the pain of your past with the unforgiveness, with what has happened because of what people have said. And God wants you to just let go right now. God wants you to release that pain. God wants you to forgive. Because what is ahead of you is better than your past. God says, I am doing a new thing. Will you not perceive it? I am doing a new thing in your life. Your dreams are valid. Your dreams are valid. I know it is a rough season right now. I know it's a tough season. But if you don't get weary, you're going to reap in due season. If you don't get weary, somebody just begin to talk to God. Say, Lord, I give you everything. I give you everything. I lean not on my own understanding my life is in the hands of the maker of heaven I lean not on my own understanding my life is in the hands of the maker of heaven I give it all to you, Lord, trusting that you make something beautiful out of me. I give it all to you, God, trusting that you make something beautiful out of me I give it all to you God trusting that you make something beautiful out of me now listen I want just to talk to God in your own words tell him Lord I give you my heart it's been wounded it's been broken I give you my life. It's been shattered. Wherever you are, I don't know. I don't want to give you the words, but just tell God what, what, what you feel. The struggles that you have and say, Lord, I give it all to you. I give it all to you. I trust that you can take these broken pieces and make them beautiful. I trust that you can take these broken dreams and build, build me up again. I pray that you can help me again, dream again, believe again, trust again, love again. I know I've tried to love and every time I've been rejected, I've been wounded, but I pray that you can heal me, that I'll be able to love again, I'll be able to believe again, I'll be able to trust again. My trust has been taken advantage of, but Lord, 
I pray that you will help me because if I don't heal, I'm going to do something stupid. I'm going to say something foolish. I'm going to hurt somebody. But Lord, I pray that you will help me that when I am healed, I'll be able to respond softly even when I'm angered. Yes, Lord, we thank you because you're doing a deep surgery in our hearts. You're doing a deep surgery in our lives. Lord, we forgive our parents. We forgive. We forgive our fathers, our mothers. We forgive those people who have taken advantage of us in relationships. We forgive the people that have rejected us. We forgive. I forgive those who have hurt me. I forgive those who have not helped me, those who have not supported me. I let go of everything that is in the past, Lord. And I, I, I hold on to that which you have for me. In the name of Jesus, let this be the beginning of a new day. Somebody, don't leave this place the same. Don't leave this place with those grudges. Don't leave this place with that anger. Don't leave this place with that pain. Don't leave this place with all that. Just I give it all to you, God. I give it all to you, God. Oh, I give it all to you, God. Trusting that you make something beautiful, beautiful out of me. I give it all to you, God. I give you my life and everything, oh God. Trusting that you make something beautiful out of me. Just right, stand up to your feet as we pray. Kore ba 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 seketelele bo shadara ba kura ba 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 zokatale bo shadara ba kura ba 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 zokoto sateri karobo zikata ya mistori bahaya iskato riba hasi kiriere bo. Just take two minutes and talk to God. Just take two minutes and talk to God. Riba has ketele. I feel that you just hold the hand of your neighbor and pray for them. Pray for that neighbor. Just pray for them. I feel like some people, God is doing a deep work in them. Just pray for somebody. Only one person. Just hold only one person's hand. Pray for somebody. If you can lay hands on them, lay hands on them and just pray for them. Just pray. Come on, pray, pray. Pray. Pray for that brother. Hold the hand of that brother. Hold the hand of that sister. I see some people who are alone. I need everybody. Pray for somebody. Just one person. Find somebody and pray for them. Hold somebody's hand and pray for them. If you are more than two, find somebody who has no one and pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Hold somebody's hand. Come on, let's begin to pray. Life is so hard for so many people. Things are so hard. People are going through so much right now. Let's pray that God will strengthen. Pray that God will strengthen that brother. Pray that God will strengthen that sister. Pray that God will heal them. Pray. Be that, be that, be that person that is going to carry their burden. In the name of just, I pray for you that you will not fail. Jesus told Peter, say, Satan has sought to sift you as wheat, but I pray that your faith will not fail. I pray that your faith will not fail. I pray that you not give up on God. I pray that you not give up on life. I pray, I pray in the name of just that you will arise from your shame, that you arise from your pain. In the name of Jesus. Shalakata. <laughs> Rata taladadana shata kastaza. In the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you. Father, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you because of your word. We thank you because of your servant. The Bible says, Blessed are the feet of they that bring forth the gospel of peace. We decree and declare that your servant is blessed. We decree refreshment. We decree a renewal in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Can we just appreciate the Lord? 
Can we just celebrate the Lord Jesus? Can we celebrate Jesus? Hallelujah. 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 We bless the name of the Lord. We have come to the close of our service today. It has indeed been a glorious